in nature, these structures can be far more complicated. And I've taken it up a notch in this slide just to show you examples of actual glycan structures that have been found on human glycoproteins. And these are examples of two varieties, one we call an N-glycan. We call this an N-glycan because it's attached to a nitrogen atom on the side chain of an asparagine residue within the protein scaffold. This variety is called an O-glycan. It's an O-glycan because it's linked to the oxygen atom on the side chain of either serine or threonine that's within the protein that's the scaffold. And as you can see, this particular N-glycan is branched. It has these two arms. We call these antenna. It turns out these N-glycans can have three antenna or four antenna. They can be much more complicated than this. And here, this is an O-glycan that also has a branch point and then another branch point. It's a pretty complicated structure. But one thing we've learned by looking at all of the different glycans in the glycome is that those structures are not random. In fact, elements of those structures are highly conserved in particular organisms. So in vertebrates, for example, the N-glycans can be very diverse in the parts that are out here, in the structures of the antenna. However, this part here that's close to the protein scaffold is generally highly conserved and similar from glycan to glycan to glycan. Likewise, in the O-glycan family, there's a lot of diversity out here, but this sugar is always conserved. It's always the same sugar that's linked in the same way to the protein backbone. So there are conserved and variable parts of these glycans. All right. Now, I mentioned that the glycans are assembled inside the Golgi and the endoplasmic reticulum. And there are enzymes that reside in those compartments that do this, this enzymatic chemistry. We call those enzymes glycosyl transferases. Now, I thought I would mention a point of historical interest, which is that um, the discovery of this mechanism of biosynthesis is largely attributed to Louis Lelouard, who back in the 1950s discovered that glycogen, which is a storage form of glucose in vertebrate systems, uh, is built biosynthetically from a precursor in which the glucose is linked to a nucleotide diphosphate. And we call this nucleotide sugar UDP glucose. Here's the UDP part, uridine diphosphate, and there's the glucose. Now, this was an important discovery because it suggested a mechanism by which glycans in general might be synthesized. And in fact, the importance of Lelouard's discovery was recognized with a Nobel Prize. In the forward sense, the way that glycogen is assembled uh, is through the action of an enzyme that one would classify as a glucosyl transferase. It transfers a glucose onto the growing polysaccharide. And the substrate it uses is, again, the UDP glucose. Now, it turns out that all of the glycosyl transferases, or I shouldn't say all, but most of the glycosyl transferases, use substrates that are similar to this nucleoside uh, diphosphosugar. And I'll just show you examples from, again, vertebrate biology. So many of the sugars can be found in this UDP form, not just glucose, but also galactose, and acetyl galactosamine, and acetyl glucosamine. Whereas some of the sugars are found linked in the form of a GDP nucleoside. For example, GDP mannose and GDP fucose. And these are the substrates for their respective glycosyl transferases. And then sialic acid kind of stands alone in vertebrate biology in that its activated form uh, is to a cytidine monophosphate, or CMP, sialic acid. And there are a family of sialyl transferases that all use this as what we call a glycosyl donor. So these are the substrates that are made inside your cells and used by your enzymes. Just to give you a sense of how enzymes might assemble a tetrasaccharide, this is a pathway that is found in vertebrate systems. So this disaccharide is synthesized, and then a sialyl transferase will take the sialic acid from CMP sialic acid and transfer it onto this sugar, converting the disaccharide to a trisaccharide. Then along comes a fucosyl transferase that will transfer fucose from GDP fucose and convert the trisaccharide to a tetrasaccharide. 
This particular tetrasaccharide has some very interesting biological properties that I'll be coming back to later in this lecture.